let's begin. So basically, um, uh, I want to just start with with painting a picture here. Um, so, you know, every everybody knows that uh, Amazon has um, a whole ton of products that that have some ML component in them. Some of them are very visible, like um, you know things that happen on the Amazon website, um, the, the the robots that move around the, the fulfillment centers, um, of course, uh, Alexa. Um, there's, there's ML driving the, the, the supply chain, um, forecasting, capacity planning, things like that. Um, and you know, there's the, the, uh, the Amazon Go stores, um, uh, but there's also ML in many, many places that you don't see as well. So it's, it's kind of a pervasive technology. This is not unique to Amazon, of course, like this is, this is kind of the, the modern world. Um, but I think um, you know this has some some pretty big implications. Um, uh, okay, so just taking Alexa as an example, um, and I think uh, Alexa is a really interesting example. So you know, what is Alexa? It's this sort of cloud-based service. So we know that um, the, your uh, when you talk to Alexa. Uh, the idea is that Alexa is learning from what you're doing, it, what you're saying. It's adapting to your speech patterns, vocabulary, and personal preferences, things like that. So that means that this is, um, by very definition, an interactive system. Um, it's not just a static deployment of some, some ML model anywhere. Um, so, you know, if we're thinking about these kind of interactive systems and um, machine learning or AI that's been deployed in the real world, how do we ensure that those systems are, are robust? How do we ensure that they're efficient? How do we you know, safeguard the privacy of our customers, which is you know, of course extremely important? Um, how do we ensure that customers are treated fairly by the, by the systems? Um, so, you know, <laughs> always good to start with the de definition what is robustness? Um, according to Wikipedia, uh, yeah. I quite like this, is, is the property of being strong and healthy in constitution. So we need our ML models to be strong and healthy in constitution. Um, but when transposed to a system, it, it refers to the ability of tolerating perturbation. Uh, sorry, I'm hearing a bit of background noise. I don't know, some of these not muted. Um, And uh, in the little see also section, you'll, you'll see like see also fault, fault tolerance system um, and resilience. So I think, you know, I think those are both uh, interesting points. And it sort of speaks to me that robustness is a bit more than maybe what people think it is just uh, on the surface. Um, so we can think about maybe like a couple of different failure modes. Um, and, you know, we can categorize this perhaps broadly into, into unintentional failures and intentional failures. So unintentional one, uh, ones where they, you know, the ML system is kind of correct in a way. Um, you know, you, you didn't make a mistake when you coded up the model or, or you know, during the training process, but something happens, um, you know, in deployment. So, you know, there might be outliers or anomalies in, in the data stream that's coming in. There could be some sort of, form of data set shift. Um, we may have limited memory or, you know, other compute problems. Um, and there could be, you know, biases in the way that the data is collected. Um, and then there's sort of like the more um, uh, sort of scary world of intentional failures. So this is, you know, maybe, maybe an active adversary trying to, uh, trying to attack the system in some way. Um, so, you know, the picture to me uh, looks like this, uh, you know, and I think perhaps, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know, but I think a lot of people maybe see the title robust machine learning and they just think about this like one portion uh, of, oh, I guess you can't see my mouse cursor probably. Uh, no, no, so I'm pointing no, to the- I can see it. Oh, you can see it. Okay, so this, uh, sort of adversarial defense. That's, that's what people mostly think about when they think about robust ML. But, but I actually think, you know, it's a much bigger picture. So we have to, you know, we have to have this sort of 
adaptivity to a potentially changing world. We have to deal with security and privacy. We have to worry about like bias mitigation in our, in our models and our data collection. Of course, we have to worry about adversaries as well. And then we also, you know, want to be able to open up the black box in some way. So, you know, some form of like transparent, transparency is also going to be an important component to this. Um, so I'm, I'm going to like touch on all of these points during the talk. Um, it's obviously like extremely difficult to try and cover all of these research areas um, in one go. Um, so I'll sort of like go a little bit more deeply in some areas and like sketch over a few others. Um, and, you know, hopefully I'll try and like bring it back to this, this complete story um, at the end. Um, so beginning with the with that adaptivity piece. Um, a lot of our machine learning models are trained um, on static data sets. You know, we have a, our typical thing is we have a training set, we have a validation set, we have a test set, or, you know, we do some sort of cross validation, whatever. And mo most of the models, I mean, this is not exclusively true, but most of the models assume that the world is stationary. So this is, you know, the, the distribution of the, in the inputs does not depend on the, on the time index. But we know that the real world is not like that, right? So there's this kind of mismatch between the choices of the models that are being used and then the reality of the systems. Um, and, and, you know, you could argue that uh, the, uh, the sort of democratization of, of, of ML that's been going on. So, you know, SageMaker is, is, a, is a fantastic resource. You can basically do like one-click deployments now. Um, you can even do auto ML, so you don't even need to choose the, the machine learning algorithm anymore. You, you know, you pass in your data set and it will sweep over, sweep over models and hyperparameter choices and, uh, and give you outputs, um, you know, and, and a, a, a very, very high performing result. Um, but this almost makes the problem worse in a way because it doesn't solve the, the, the underlying problem. Um, so we need to we need to be able to cope with uh, with changes that are happening in the world. Um, so if we think about like how data, you know, okay, this is maybe not true if you're doing some like statistical analysis of of, of a fixed data set for some uh, for some scientific purpose. But if we think about like web data and data that's like collected. Um, from, from the behavior of humans, which is most of what Amazon does. Um, we're in this situation where data is arriving continually. It's you know, possibly not identical, independent, identically distributed. Um, in fact, very probably not. We may have tasks that change over time. Um, so you know, this could be like trends or changes in fashions and shopping. Um, you know, we can have new tasks that emerge, so new product categories, new marketplaces, like, you know, if we have, um, you know, we built our language models to work in certain, uh, certain languages, and suddenly we have a, a completely new marketplace open, which, which, which uh, you know, even if they speak the same language, they might have different uses of, of words. So like, how do we, how do we easily incorporate that? Um, so then, you know, if, if we think about robustness, it's like, how do we, how are we able to adapt to the new data whilst retaining the old knowledge, the existing knowledge? Um, and, you know, transparency is, is the co component that basically says, like, how can we know if our system has gone wrong? So, you know, I think that's uh, almost as important as having a robust system in the first place is knowing when your system has gone wrong. Um, so, you know, the sort of like standard approaches that, that uh, people tend to take is, you know, we just like train models on individual tasks and we just keep retraining, retrain, retrain, retrain. Um, it's it's uh, kind of a not very scalable solution. Um, you know, it'd be much better if we could have some form of online learning or continual learning. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, I would say, you know, one of the most active areas of, of research in, in machine learning at the moment. Um, and there's definitely a lot of exciting things coming out of it. 
Um, so, you know, for a while we, uh, um, we've been looking at uh, Bayesian continual learning. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I don't really expect you, uh, I guess some of the readers of this will instantly read this and, and understand it and others won't. So I'm not really gonna talk you through the, the details of the maths here, but, but essentially, um, you know, we, uh, what we're gonna say is that we're gonna like use our, um, use the, the, the machinery of, um, of Bayesian inference to keep our beliefs about the world around. And we're just gonna do this kind of resetting rather than like retraining a model from scratch, we're gonna say, okay, the next time we see a new task or we see new data, we, we're gonna basically use our posteriors from the, from the previous rounds of inference. Um, and, you know, this could be applied in, in many different uh, circumstances. So the same kind of simple recursive formula can be, can be applied uh, just for like Bayesian logistic regression or for Bayesian neural networks for Gaussian processes. It can be applied to cases where you're adding in new classes. So, you know, this, this capital T, uh, sorry, T is the task, but the the um, the the number of classes in YT could be changing over time, for example, um, and this can be all all handled by the the same framework. Um, so it, it's you know it's really attractive. We have this natural recursive al algorithm. Uh, there's a caveat here: so long as you use some kind of variational posterior. So you know, in truth, the actual like real, real Bayesian posterior is gonna be far too complicated. Um, it's not gonna be amenable to be used as a, as, a, as a prior distribution. So typically people make pretty strong assumptions about what, what the posterior is gonna uh, look like in order to do this. Um, so, you know, just an example of this, uh, just, to, just to sort of like put some, some meat on it, I guess. Uh, here is a, an example of how you might use this in uh, for generative models. So the idea is that um, our training data here is just going to be uh, images. Um, so we're first going to see only zeros. You know, this is standard MNIST type images. And then on, in our, uh, the, uh, the second sort of iteration of this, we're only going to see the digit one. And the third iteration, we're going to only see the digit two. And our task at each time is going to be to basically generate from any of the classes that I've seen before. Um, so this is pretty challenging, really. Like, you know, on the first one, okay, we've seen zeros, we have to generate zeros. But by the time we get to this third task, we've seen zeros, ones, and twos, and we need to be able to generate all, all three different classes of image. Um, but it's a while since we've seen the zeros. And, you know, for digits, there's maybe only 10 classes here and it's not such a big problem. You know, we can probably just exhaustively train on everything. Um, but, you know, if we had potentially like thousands of different classes here, um, that's, a, that's a much bigger problem. And the, the, the phrase that you'll see a lot is um, catastrophic forgetting, which is that, you know, if you just train a neural network uh, to, um, to, to update, as you see more and more data, it will just forget about the past. Um, so the idea is that the, uh, the we can make use of um, our, our sort of our um, Bayesian posterior to, to, to hold that belief about the past. Um, there is a caveat there, um, uh, which, which I'll come to first. So um, the, Oh, sorry, excuse me. Okay, uh, so the caveat is that um, the, Bayesian problem, the Bayesian solution doesn't really solve the, the, the catastrophic forgetting uh, problem on its own. You also need some kind of model in there of, of the dynamics of how you expect the, the data to be changing over time. Because otherwise, you're, um, as you see more and more data, your Bayesian posterior will start like, shrinking and shrinking um, because each time you see more data you get more certain about things and then like you know you as as you can imagine like as you roll this out to to very very large data sets you'll you'll end up with basically point masses 
Um, so, uh, but at least like the, the Bayesian framework gives you a way of reasoning about like how my data is expected to change and, and how I should uh, how I should cope with that in the same modeling framework. Um, um, but yeah, there are still some problems with this, like variational posteriors that I mentioned, they can be pretty limiting. Um, you know, I know there's some, uh, some, some work going on at Bristol even about, uh, about trying to, trying to have richer kind of posterior classes than, um, than the sort of naive mean field variational posteriors that, that people tend to use. Um, I mentioned this point about the, the, uh, the collapsing to point masses. And, and there's, there's always the, the elephant in the room with Bayesian approaches, they're more, more computationally um, expensive and they're kind of harder to, 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 to train and, and implement and deal with. Um, so, you know, I think, I think the point here, rather than like hammering on about uh, this particular Bayesian method is that this is still an open area of research. Um, and, uh, that means that you know if we're going to do this, um, if we're going to try and do something about it now in the real world, you know, are we, you know, am I going to uh, try and select some some like hugely complex Bayesian model, or am I going to try and think about how can I best mitigate the problems using an engineering based solution, um, and. Uh, so we, you know, we've been doing a bit of thinking about this and trying to think of what a like what a a, a holistic sort of system would look like that wraps around your your standard sort of ML model training um, loop that you normally see that gives you this kind of control that you need. Um, so, you know, we, you can think of some basic components that you might need. You need sort of like, uh, you need to be able to sort of join the right pieces of data that are coming in. You might need to do some sort of sketching or compressing. It would be, um, you really like to have kind of a shared infrastructure. You don't want to be, you know, if you're continually training or continually updating models, you don't want them running away with, uh, with memory usage and, and, and storage usage, although, you know, storage tends to be cheap compared to compute. Um, but, you know, and the idea here is that the whole system should share the same uh, resource constraints, really. Um, and, you know, much in the same way that a, an, op an operating system manages its own cache and deals with, you know, what, what, what should be what's like hot data, what should be kept fresh and what, um, what can be discarded. I think the same should be true for, for a, like an ML system, you know, keep around data that you might need for, for retraining or, or validation and, and make sure that the, the right amount of data is there and it's updated when it needs to be. Um, and then of course you need like various different monitoring um, and quality control systems in there. So you, you really should be looking at the, the input data. Is that, is that changing over time? So can we, can we have some kind of data set shift detection in there, anomaly detection? Um, and, and then kind of the other end of that is monitoring what comes out of the model. So can we look at, you know, if we don't have labels available at, at test time, can we just look at the distribution over the, over the predicted classes? Is that changing significantly? So if my model starts predicting all of one class when previously it never did that, that's a sign that something going, something's going wrong. And of course you maybe have like limited access to some true, like uh, some, some uh, ground truth that maybe comes in um, sometime after you've made your predictions. So you want, if you have that, you wanna be able to tie that back in and make sure that you're using that. Um, and then there's sort of, you know, automating the ML life cycle. I spoke about like auto ML very briefly, but you know, this is, uh, this is sort of like the way things are going that we want to try and take as many manual steps as possible out of the, out of the actual training process so that we don't need to worry about how we set up our cross validation and how we do our hyperparameter optimization.
Um, and then the last component here is um, uh, this model policy engine, which is, I think, a, a really in interesting component, which is basically like, how do I make decisions about what the best thing to do at the, uh, at the best, uh, the, at the, any particular time is so you know if I see that my model's doing something wrong, you know what are what are the mechanisms, what are the levers I have to pull? You know it might just be kick off a training job, um, or you know escalate, you know send a send a uh, uh, a ticket out to to the to the on call team or something like that. But but there's going to be like a uh, you know a whole bunch of different ways that you can basically like modify the, the way the system is operating. Um, and, you know, that in itself, uh, you could imagine being somewhat of an intelligent system as well. I mean, there's a possibility here that you might want to try different policies and you could start thinking about, well, okay, you know, could I cast this as a, as an, as a reinforcement learning problem or something like that? Um, so, this is just a, a pictorial um, representation of the same thing, but this is, you know, sort of a data flow. If we have our, our streaming data coming in and then we have like our monitoring on the input side, um, the data gets sent to the, to this sort of trainer, which is, in, um, which is in charge of like training, updating models, um, you know, ensembling, keeping them around, whatever it is. Um, and uh, then we have this sort of prediction monitoring component. Um, and of course, we wanna like link this up to, to any business logic that's there as well. Um, you know, one, one thing that, that uh, is often the case is that there are, there are business metrics, which, um, which may not be sort of directly comparable to the actual ML metrics. Um, so it can be, you know, you can have a, a, an extra sort of source of complexity here as well. Okay. Um, so uh, in summary, like, I think continual learning is where, where the field is kind of going here. Um, but, you know, in, in, in my view, it's kind of, you know, there's there's these nice methods, but they're not necessarily like production ready. Um, so, you know, I think this this engineering viewpoint is 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 also required. And um, you know, there's a lot of work actually to to you know achieve some of the goals that I outlined in that image. Um, and if I've got time at the end, I'll sort of touch on on that a little bit. Um, okay, so. Uh, onwards and upwards. Um, maybe I'll just pause quickly. Has anyone got any questions at this point? I do actually. Hi Tom. Hi Neil. Um, I'm just curious, how on earth can you manage all of this? I mean, it, it sounds great, but I'm just trying to imagine how I could kind of have a finger, a hand in each of those cookie jars and uh, it could be kind of overwhelming, I, I reckon. Yes, right. Yeah. I mean, I guess like the point is that um, it, it shouldn't be a single person managing it at the end of the day. I mean, the, the, I, you know, the, I don't know if you saw the total, the title of this slide was zero touch machine learning. I mean, zero touch is maybe a little ambitious. It's like saying, you know, it should be, you know, zero touch implies you don't touch it. This like runs by itself and, <laughs> and it does everything by itself. You know, that's a bit aspirational, but I, I think, um, you know, low touch is maybe the way of thinking of it. So it's like if you architect it in the right way um, and you have the right mechanisms in place to, to tell you when things are going wrong, then, then actually like the requirement of the human always to be on call, always, always, you know, always trying to work out where things have gone wrong and, um, should be reduced. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I ask a quick question about this? Um, yes. So, um, how, where is um, the kind of incremental and active learning fit, fit in this um, zero touch machine learning scheme? So, where this can be? 
Uh, yeah, so this, that to me is in this sort of like policy engine and uh, sort of training loop. I guess like, um, I mean, active learning is a good point. You know, I, I, I guess if you wanted to do that strictly, you should have some kind of arrow here, which, which goes from the policy engine back to your uh, data streams, because you want to have like active data selection as well. Um, and that's maybe not made explicit by this, but the, the you know, the, the point I made about this policy engine, like could in theory be an RL system, or it could be um, an active learning system is, you know, that's, that's the point here. So you, you know, you have your under, underlying ML system uh, that's being controlled there. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, I have a quick one. Okay. And you mentioned okay. um, transparency and explain, explainability in, in the outline of, you know, the circular figure that you were defining to use robust. Yeah. Does that feature in, yeah. in your machine learning zero touch uh, model as well? Uh, yes. Um, and I will get to it. Um, I mean, briefly, just to say transparency to me is is sort of on this this box around prediction monitoring and things like that. It could be, you know, I think the the phrase here could be expanded about uh, um, a bit as well. Um, yeah, I, I I will try and get to that. I, I realize that I've been hugely ambitious with time here, so <laughs> we'll see how we do. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna to switch to security and privacy here. And actually, I'm just gonna focus on, on privacy uh, for the moment. Um, oh, why'd it go backwards? Okay. So, you know, um, if we're dealing with data that's collected from, uh, from, uh, from, you know, naturally gathered organic human, uh, uh, human interactions with the system, um, we have to worry about uh, protecting the privacy of the users. And, you know, you might just say, well, can't I just anonymize my data? Um, and uh, this is what people did for a long time. You know, they started, there's this uh, very standard algorithm, K-anonymity, um, which basically says, uh, you know, as so long as I can't distinguish from at least K minus one individuals who also appear, then, then that's safe to, to reveal. Um, so maybe here you, you sort of say, uh, okay, well, if I start off with this data set that looks like this, you know, I have this, uh, this person, the data set who's, you know, working in London in the IT department has some, some salary. There's probably not enough digits these days for that, but there's the date of birth and nationality and gender. And you think, oh, okay. So, you know, what's, uh, if I, if I reduce this to be the, the UK, and then I put the, the date of birth into an age range and I remove the nationality, you know, is that good enough? Like, have we, have we obfuscated everything we need to know about the, the, the individual? But this still poses a risk, right? If there are 10 females born in, in that uh, age range in the whole of the UK's IT department, nine of them could work out what the salary of the 10th one is. Um, and, and the problem here that, it's, that we're getting at is that this kind of thing is not robust to, to side information. Um, and uh, I, I'm not gonna go into these. I, I think these are all things you can look up, but basically there's been many, many cases now where, uh, where data has been released in, you know, in all good faith, um, for, for research purposes or, you know, for other reasons. And, um, and people have managed to reverse engineer information about the, the people contained in that data set. So, you know, this, uh, this uh, um, Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission was one of the, the first cases. Um, there's the Netflix um, uh, um, case, which was, You've just muted yourself, Tom. What someone's muted you? Oh, interesting. Okay, can you hear me again? Yes, can hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, and you know, I think I think if you don't know about these examples, you should go and look them up because they are really quite scary. Um, and you know, and the point in the in all of these cases is like you know, 
the data was scrubbed and it was released to the public, but there was always some other data source that was available that, that the, the releases of the data didn't think about in advance. So what can we do about this? Um, so there are, there, are, there are a bunch of different sort of privacy enhancing technologies that could be used. Um, I would say that probably the most popular one um, and um, uh, the most, I guess, ready to use as, as a technology is differential privacy. Um, so differential privacy, formally speaking, is, this, is, is a randomized mechanism um, and we say that we have this like epsilon differential privacy if for two neighboring inputs. Um, so that's basically like if you have, uh, if you can think about it like this, if you have a database um, and a neighboring database where you just changed the data about one individual. So you've either like removed an individual or added one in or somehow changed what, what's in there that you shouldn't be able to, to tell the difference between those two databases. Um, and and it's, it's actually, you know, it's a, it's a probabilistic bound that you get, um, which is kind of interesting in itself. It's, you know, it's not a, um, it's, not, it's not deterministic, it's, it's, it's only defined in high probability. Um, but it, it sort of protects you against these, uh, it, the exact kind of attacks that I was describing before. Um, so like a really, really simple way of, of, of producing a differentially private mechanism. Um, uh, so, you know, this was obviously like in, in 1965, this was before the definition of, of differential privacy, but like later on, and the DP researchers realized that actually this super simple mechanism uh, uh, is differentially private. So basically, if you if you want to re release a bit of information, so just yes or no, you uh, flip a coin, and then if it lands tails, you respond with the truth. If it lands on heads, you flip an, uh, a second coin, and then you just respond according to what the coin said. Um, and you can compute what this is. Um, uh, this basically tells you that uh, e to the epsilon is is three. So this is like log three differential privacy. Um, and it's just a pretty simple uh, computation of the, of, the, of the possibilities there. Um, so some important pro properties about this, uh, we have robustness to post-processing. So, you know, if, if you have a differentially private mechanism, then any function that's applied, any operation that you apply over the top of that is still at least epsilon uh, delta differentially private. Um, we have this nice composition property, which is if we have um, several different um, differentially private mechanisms, then the, uh, the combination of those is just the sum over the epsilons and the sum over the deltas. And, um, and the, probably the most important thing is this point about it protects against arbitrary side knowledge. So there's nothing you can do um, as an adversary by like by adding in side knowledge that will that will uh, that will undo what the what differential privacy does. Um, so you know there's there's always going to be a trade-off here. So basically like the way this works um, in that coin flipping example we saw you know we are adding noise to the answers. Um, in, in expectation over a lot of answers, you know, if, if, we, if we did that experiment a lot of times, we'll still get the right answer um, in expectation. But for, for smaller numbers, um, then, you know, you, you, have, you now have noise in your data. And basically like the, the epsilon that you have, like in, in, that, uh, in that coin flipping example, we had a fixed epsilon. But you can imagine if it's not just a simple uh, coin example, but something where the epsilon can actually be moved. We then have this sort of uh, um, trade-off between privacy and utility. Um, and you know, uh, uh, an example here is so this is um, this is pretty popular these days. Differentially private SGD. So you could basically make any neural network 
differentially private by uh, just slightly modifying um, the uh, the algorithm. So you you basically have this uh, this noise variance that you add to your gradients, and then you do this gradient clipping as well, um, which is just needed there to make the to make the proofs go through. Um, and then you have this um, you, you you basically have the 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 differential privacy guarantees for for any neural network that you can train. Um, this poses a problem, though, which is that you have you now have extra hyperparameters. So you had your all of your neural network parameters that you already had your you know your batch sizes and epochs and uh, learning rates or whatever. Um, but we we now have two extra parameters from from differential privacy, um, and you know optimizing uh, simultaneously for utility and privacy is is going to be a challenge here. Um, so just like in pictures, what this looks like is um, we have a bunch of, uh, we have this like hyperparameter space, which is, as I said, is like your neural network parameters plus your uh, privacy parameters. And then, you know, at each point in the space, you're going to get a uh, something like a test error or, or you know, some, some way of evaluating your, your, uh, your model. Um, plus some epsilon value. So basically, depending on how you set all of your hyperparameters, you'll get a different, uh, you'll get a different pri privacy loss. And, and interestingly, like the, um, the privacy guarantees depend not only on the hyperparameters of the, of the differential privacy, they also depend, can depend on the neural network hyperparameters as well. So for example, like, because you're adding noise at every single gradient step, if you have more batches, or you know, uh, 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 or if you stop early, you're going to have a different incurred privacy loss than um, than if you ran for longer. Um, so if you run this a few times, you know, you have a different uh, set of hyperparameters. You get a different error and privacy loss, um, and we keep going. And then eventually, what you'll be able to do is sort of draw out, you know, you'll be able to describe what's called the Pareto front. So these are the, the Pareto optimal um, points, empirically speaking, um, which is to say that, you know, for any given privacy loss, I can't achieve a better error than this, or the vice versa. For any given error level, I can't achieve a stronger privacy guarantee. Um, so, you know, a question might be, um, like, how do I find the best place along this. So you could just do this empirically. Um, you know, if you have enough time and money, you could train many, many, many models. Um, but it, you know, you might also want to sort of optimize this, this Pareto front. Um, so again, I won't go into the details here, but this is a, a, a piece of work we did looking at using Bayesian optimization um, in order to directly optimize this, this Pareto front. Um, okay, so to sum up on, on this topic, you know, again, I think this is, this is active research and is, is kind of borderline, whether you want to call this production ready in a way. I think, you know, one of the hardest things is to convince stakeholders that a, uh, that a particular epsilon value is, is meaningful, um, and, um, and that the utility loss is, uh, is acceptable. You know, people, people spend a lot of time driving for utility gains. So if you tell them that there's going to be a utility loss, uh, you have to justify that. Okay, I'm going to pause again. Any questions on this? One quick one. How big is the utility loss typically? Um, sort of have you found that differential privacy really does impact performance? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's dependent on a whole bunch of things, as you can imagine. Um, it's dependent on how much data you have. It, it's dependent on what you're trying to train. Um, I would say uh, that there, there is almost always a, a loss. There's this, there's, there are some kind of weird, rare occasions where there, there's almost no 
privacy loss. Um, and, and you'll find there's a, like, there's a paper which is called Privacy for Free. Um, <laughs> I mean, privacy never comes for free, but you know, I think the the point is, uh, you know, I think that was specifically about linear regression, and it sort of tells you, um, like asymptotically, as you get more and more data, you recover the exact answer. Um, you can kind of think that the noise here could have some sort of regularization effect. So you know, if you if you took the regularization out of your model and then basically used BP instead, you might you might get away with it. Um, but typically, like, you know, I would I would expect like a couple of percentage points difference or something like that. You know, it's it's definitely, definitely has an impact. And and you know, as I said, like if you're trying to optimize for the like third decimal place of your of your, <laughs> your accuracy, then two percent sounds awful. But if you're, you know, if if that's good enough for, for the use case, then um, then it's okay. Thanks. There's a question. Okay. Tom. Um, yeah. What would be some causal approaches to enhancing model robustness? Causal approaches. Okay, I'm gonna come back to that question. I think it's a really interesting question, um, but I, I'll sort of think about that in the background. Um, okay, so uh, I realize like there isn't a huge amount of time, um, but I haven't actually got a huge amount of content here either. So um, I just think it's important to sort of touch on some of these topics. Um, I think, you know, fairness is, is, is uh, so, you know, bias mitigation and fairness is a really, um, also a really like uh, pervasive topic at the moment. Um, you know, we have certain risks, uh, particularly, I think, when we have data which is collected in this sort of organic fashion. So, you know, we haven't, we haven't gone out, we're not, um, you know, we're not like uh, uh, pollsters or something like that who are going around and specifically saying, okay, we want like, we want to collect data which, which covers like all of the key demographics and is exactly like stratified and all of that. You know, we, 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 we most of the time don't have the luxury of that. Um, so we need to be super careful, particularly if we're optimizing directly for ML metrics, like, you know, accuracy or whatever it is, um, that we don't uh, accidentally optimize only for the for the for the portion of our training data who were the most represented. Um, and there's many many kind of classical examples of where this has gone wrong. Um, and I think this is you know you, you kind of think well okay where's the differential privacy equivalent of fairness. Um, and the problem is like, unlike in privacy, there's no single agreed on definition. There are actually like many competing definitions and they, you know, you read them all um, and you can go and find, I think there's a nice talk somewhere which is 27 fairness definitions or something like that. They all make sense. They all like, you know, you read it and you're like, oh, okay, you know, this, this sort of like makes sense as a fairness definition. Like, then you read the other one, you're like, oh, okay, that also makes sense. but but they don't really agree with each other. So I think, you know, this is, this is a really kind of interesting problem for, 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 the, for the ML community. Um, so, you know, this is, I'll just like speak about one definition here just to make this concrete. concrete. Um, you know, if we think about like, we can think about statistical bias. Um, so that might be the difference between the expected value of an estimate and its true value um, is that, a good enough criterion. Um, and, you, you know, this is sort of comes into this like, uh, okay, well, my model just was trained on the data. You know, my model doesn't have any bias in it. Um, but, you know, it, 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 this isn't good enough really, because like, I think, you know, as, as, as an owner of an ML system, you kind of have to take ownership here. Um, so another idea is, is calibration. Um, so, you know, you're probably all familiar with the, the definition of calibration. Um, Philip Davids is, is a very nice one, which is, you know, if a, a forecaster is well calibrated, if, 
in the long run of events, uh, you know, you assign a probability of 30%, um, then it actually happens 30% of the time. Um, so you can you can make a fairness definition out of this as well. Um, again, sorry about the like heavy heavy notation here, um, but it's like you you know you could say well uh, I could I could be um, alpha accurate by saying like the expectation between my predictions and the truth is within some alpha, or I could be alpha calibrated if for any probability or you know any uh, point in the probability space, then um, the difference between that and my expectation is, is less than or equal to alpha. Um, this pro has problems as well, though, because, you know, you can kind of game this. You can, um, you can make a system that's perfectly calibrated um, and, and, you know, just in the same way that you could, like, make a weather forecaster in the UK be perfectly calibrated by saying, it's going to rain like 30% of the time or whatever. You can do this in this, this, this uh, setting as well, um, just like by, by doing it within the, the sort of the demographic groups. Um, so typically this is applied to sort of like large disjoint sets of your data, um, but it's, it's kind of not perfect. Um, the, there's this proposal of something which is stronger, which is called multi-calibration. Um, which is basically saying like the ideal thing to be would be to be calibrated everywhere. So to be calibrated for every possible subset of my data. Now, of course, that's impossible. The only way you can you could uh, you could achieve that is by having perfect predictions forever. Um, it's also computationally impossible because you can't you know for any reasonable uh, size data set you know set of features. You're not going to be able to, to compute the power set, so the, the every possible subset of features. Um, so they, they define this sort of like computational identifiable subset definition, which is sort of like, okay, well, I'll just randomly sample subsets. And if I have enough of those, then um, then that's like going to be good enough. And you know, in the paper, they argue that you can sort of throw in the typical uh, sets that you would have been interested in anyway. So you could you can include your, um, you know, race and gender and things like that into, into those computationally identifiable subsets. But you, you, you're sort of somewhat protected against the, the things that you didn't code for. Um, but again, you know, I think, you know, I think there's, there's not one particular notion here um, which is gonna save us. Um, at least these things can be run post hoc, and so you can do checks afterwards. And and there are some pretty good systems for doing that these days. Um, this last point is not clear at all. Um, I think some of the some of the fairness de definitions um, will uh, will sort of like sit happier with, for example, with differential privacy than others. But I think this is like an interesting open area of research. Um, what's the time? Seven minutes, oh dear. <laughs> um, okay, um, so I, I'm just gonna sort of like whiz through and hopefully we still have time for a couple of questions. So, I mean, probably like uh, when, as I said at the beginning, like a lot of people might have thought, oh, here's, Tom's gonna talk about robot, you know, adversarial machine learning, adversarial defense. And, you know, this is, this is a component of it, but I think, you know, the, the fact that these two have been like tied together so heavily to me is, is a bit of a misnomer, but I couldn't really give this talk without speaking about it. So, um, you know, what is, what is adversarial ML? Uh, you know, in, in general, it's like attempts either to fool the models or to steal information, either about the model or the data. Uh, that the model was trained on. So we can think of like adversarial examples, and I'm sure you've all seen like the panda that gets misclassified as the whatever it is with a single pixel change. I don't, you know, these kinds of things. That's your uh, a sort of very, very um, sort of standard thing. I think these are interesting, these sort of like Trojan attacks or backdoor attacks. So the idea here is like if I'm using some like machine learning as a service, so I'm outsourcing it, then 
then you could train your machine learning algorithm to be to do well on the data provided by the by the user, but still be able to uh, to um, do unexpected things on some particular data that you provide. So you know you could basically encode those single pixel attacks into your model. Um, so don't trust, <laughs> you know, that would be like a don't trust a random person to train your model for you. Um, a model inversion is sort of like trying to work out, okay, what were the, you know, if I just have an API access to a model, am I able to work out what all the parameters uh, are in, uh, in there? Um, and there's some, some interesting attacks there. And membership inference is going back to the, the privacy cases, like can I work out if a, a given individual was in the data or a given data point? Um, and, you know, under, under defense strategies, like the first four of these, I would, have, would say are all kind of directly borrowed from just security practices in, in software engineering. So threat modeling, you know, that's what everybody does when they're engineering a robust so software system attack simulation, um, impact evaluation, and countermeasure design. These are all like very, very standard practices. There's kind of nothing specific to ML here. Um, I think this, uh, the, the bits that are specific, like this, this sort of noise detection component, um, that, uh, that links back to, to needing a good anomaly detector in there. You know, I think if, you, if you're able to, to detect uh, adversarial examples there, you know, you'd, you'd also be able to detect just like strongly out distribution samples. Um, and there's this sort of interesting phrase, information laundering, you know, there's, there's a defense strategy, which is basically, I'm gonna do something to the input data in order that this type of um, adversar adversarial attack isn't going to work. And you could imagine uh, here that, you know, a differential, differentially private mechanism might actually be able to uh, to 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 work as an information laundering system. Um, I'm not sure if that formal link has ever been made yet. But. Um, and you know, just uh, you know, there's a bunch of resources here. Um, I think that, uh, there's some some interesting libraries. Uh, the the robust.ml is is this quite nice community run hub. Um, where you can basically upload, uh, you know, new attacks or new defenses, um, and you know, there's various different places where you can where you can try out different things. I found like uh, nearly everything is computer vision based, so there seems to be a bit of a gap here. I mean, I, there, there are probably others who, who are listening to this who maybe know more than me about this, but um, again, like you know, I think this is this is still a, a growing area research and to me is 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 not really like a, a solved problem at all um okay i promised to talk about transparency and i'm kind of out of time um what so uh can i ask the organizers what what the deal is if we r run over for a few minutes or is or would you rather not do that at all I think in practice, a few minutes should be fine, Tom. So um, I, I, if, 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 if individual uh, members would uh, need to wander away, that's absolutely fine. I understand we are recording the session as uh, most sessions are indeed recorded. So if, if anybody uh, is forced to get leave at 12 o'clock, um, this recording will be available on the website, on the JGI website after the fact. Okay, thanks, Sam. Yeah, so um, ap apologies to anyone who needs to leave. Um, you know, you can you can always reach me by by email as well if you want to uh, ask questions, and I'm sure uh, Sam can provide that. Um, okay, so uh, again, this is like a, a you know an, a, an open area of research, and I know that um, again, there's there's people in Bristol who are, who are interested in this, um, so I might be preaching to the converted a little bit here. Um, but you know, one of the one of the issues that we have is like increasingly that we're using these, you know, black box or or maybe gray box models. We have these like extremely complicated models. If we think of like a twelve layer BERT language model, you know, it has ninety million parameters in it. How on earth are we? You know, okay, you can do something. You can look at the attention maps and you can try and like work out different things and. Um, 
but I guess a, a more general question is like, can I get simpler explanations uh, about a complex model in, in, in a kind of model agnostic way? Um, so these sort of like additive feature attribution methods uh, try to do that. So they basically like you have your complex model F and you're gonna try and use a simpler explanation model G, um, which is going to approximate the complex model just in the region around a given uh, input data point. So it's gonna be like dependent on the data. Um, and typically like what you do is like, you can imagine that there's sort of like some, your complex model has some really like nonlinear surface around there, but the, uh, the, you could use a linear approximation to, to, the, to that small region of space. Um, and the explanation model is basically gonna take a sum over the features or the effects of different features uh, in, in, in the model. Um, and, you know, it, you can just simply think of this as saying, okay, my prediction changes by a certain amount if I include a given feature or don't include a given feature. Um, and, you know, Lime is, is a popular um, implementation of this, which sort of uses this very simple um, uh, um, objective function where you're, you're, um, you're minimizing the, the, the basically the difference between what your complex model and your explanation model says uh, with some regularization over the over the explanation model. Um, and there's you know there's various sort of different uh, um, proposed methods that, that expand on this as well. Um, another another popular popular thing which is uh, which is being used quite commonly nowadays are called Shapley values. Um, so this sort of takes inspiration from, from game theory. Um, and the idea is that you have a, a team of players uh, with a certain payout and you wanna sort of distribute the payout ac according to the players um, in a fair way. And it's interesting, this comes back to fairness and the Shapley values have their own definition of fairness. So everything I said about fairness and all the caveats still holds here. Like, this again is one definition, like uh, efficiency, the contributions must add up to the total payout, symmetry, if two players contribute the same, then their, their output should be the same. You know, you read this and it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's totally reasonable, all, all totally makes sense. Um, but I think the authors of the paper would say, oh, this is the only fairness definition, but it's not. <laughs> um, and then, you know, if you're gonna apply this to ML models, like your payout is now the, the model predictions and the players are the individual input features. Um, and what we're doing is we're saying like, how much of the model prediction can be attributed to each input feature. Um, and the, the authors claimed in the paper that this is the only additive attribution method that satisfies all of those fairness pro properties. Um, for their given definition of what fairness is. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I'm not gonna really uh, go into it more than that other than say, you know, this is, this is kind of a, a, a popular method, method and empirically seems to do quite well, like these SHAP values. Uh, so SHAP is a particular imp implementation of the SHAP values is uh, they match better with human intuition compared to other methods. Um, but I think there's still some open questions. There's a lot of like independence assumptions that are encoded in the method. Um, and it's not really what cl what clear what happens when you move out to out of distribution sample. Um, okay, so that, that was kind of like, <laughs> a very breathless tour of all of these different topics. And to me that, you know, that sort of like, that whole thing, every one of those is in, is, is in itself a research area, but that whole thing is like, that's really like, if we're gonna truly achieve machine learning systems that don't go wrong, um, then we, we kind of need all of that, um, which <laughs> makes us, as, as Neil pointed out earlier, that makes life awfully difficult. Um, you know, I think, uh, at, at Amazon, we're trying to solve some of these problems. You know, there's a whole bunch of um, uh, uh, products in the in the SageMaker Maker catalog, um, and you know, really, like uh, uh, we're we're trying to make 
life easier and make a, a lot of this uh, complexity go away for, for users by sort of like linking up really, really good, um, uh, well-engineered solutions to problems. Um, so just like two of those. So uh, in in the reInvent 2020, so just uh, just before, just at the end of last year, um, SageMaker Clarify was announced. Um, and this basically uh, it is is tackling the, the 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 sort of the fairness and the transparency. So they actually have uh, Shap implemented in there, um, and they have um, um, some some bias detection algorithms as well. Um, and uh, there's the SageMaker model monitor, which essentially is is uh, is doing the the drift detection. Um, and model quality metric uh, uh, detection that I spoke about before, um, and it it links together with the with the, the Clarify service. You also get this kind of you get drift in in bias. It'll tell you if, if your your system, which was originally not biased, has, has drifted and become biased over over time. Um, okay, so just like super high level summary. Machine learning requires more than just like clever algorithms, and um, you know I think we really need to think about all of these these issues. Um, I really like this book by Michael Kearns and Aaron Roth. It's quite you know it's quite readable, the ethical algorithm. So I'd recommend um, a read of that if you're interested in these topics. Okay, cool. Um, I am happy to to stick around for for questions a bit more, but you know feel free to uh, to drop if you need to. Thank you very much, Tom, for a fantastic talk. I will I will applaud on behalf of everybody in the room. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm guessing there's going to be quite a few questions, uh, quite a lot of interest. Uh, there's a lot of food for thought there. So if, if anybody does have a question, if they could uh, raise their hand or type into the, into the chat as a, as a first port of call, that would be fantastic. Um, but obviously, if uh, yes, there actually already is a, chat, a question in the chat. So um, I'll, I'll read it out for the benefit of everybody here. Uh, with monitoring machine learning predictions for distribution shifts and adapting them on the fly, is there a practical limit to how fast the system could adapt? Or are some changes likely to be too fast, for example, for goods distribution, having a national border being closed with a few hours notice? Is there any hope on the horizon for systems that can be robust to rapid sh shifts in circumstances? <laughs> yeah, very interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, what that will depend on is is how fast your you know with this bit that I call the policy engine, um, whatever it is that's kind of acting and making decisions on the basis of of the shift detect and how how quickly that can act and what what the kind of iteration cycle is. I think it, you know if if you if you're stuck in this like we have this gigantic model and we're gonna retrain it every time we get like 24 hours worth of data in or a week's worth of data, then you're obviously gonna be stuck because all of your, you know, all of your scripts and everything that have to run um, are gonna be fixed to certain time intervals. They're gonna be fixed to like data collection intervals and things like that. So, you know, if, if um, you know, if you have this case where it waits for a week until it retrains, and then I don't know, you know, like uh, like you say, a border gets closed or something like that, how are you gonna, you know, are you gonna be able to kick off a new training job or, or you know, what's gonna be the policy that allows you to update fast enough? I think as you move to away from that sort of like fixed time paradigm and you move to more adaptive systems and more, like more like real continual learning, then you have the ability to adapt faster. Um, I, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because you you also don't want to necessarily like overreact or or react to every every small change that's happening. So I think that's um, yeah. I mean that's that's a, it's a it's a really interesting question. There's kind of a flip side to it as well, which is that if the change is so slow as to be almost undetectable, then I think, you know, it's gonna, you're gonna have a very, very hard time actually doing anything about that. Thanks that, Tom. Um, and I'm currently not seeing any hands or uh, further questions in the chat. 
Um, so, so I guess it means we can. So there was the people. yeah. Well, there was the question about causality, which I think is is really really interesting. Um, I would imagine like. Okay, so so if you if you want to do some sort of causal inference, um, you you really have to be able to make interventions um, in some way. Otherwise, like you know, if uh, you're never really going to be able to unpick the um, the actual causal reasons of why things are ha happening, unless you have like you know you you actually know the causal graph perfectly then you might be able to do it purely from data. But in ge generally speaking, like ca the causal graph is unknown, has to be estimated. Um, and then the, you know, the only way you can really do that is if, if, you, if you make some kind of inter interventions. People do make interventions at the moment. They do things like A-B testing and um, you know, other ways of uh, like running auctions and things like that. But it's um, not very well formulated, I would say, if you do it using those methods. Uh, yeah, I, it's a good question. I should uh, try and think about that more. There is one final question in the chat, um, which I think we may make the last question just in the interest of time. Apologies, apologies to anybody still with questions. Um, the AI committee at Parliament refuted uh, with the use of machine learning models that do not provide a satisfactory explanation and advocated the use of hmm. interpretable uh, machine learning models. Uh, do you think we are too quick in the use of neural networks uh, where simpler, more interpretable models can be deployed? And do you think it's fair to make such requirements become legislative? Wow. I mean, uh, yeah, really, really interesting topic, isn't it? Um, I mean, I think, I think uh, you know, I always, I always have this thing of like, okay, if are you really going to sacrifice performance for for interpretability? That's that's one thing. Like, say you know, say we are designing something which is going to be a medical diagnostic. Uh, do we? Do, what do we care about more? Do we care about being interpret, able to interpret the model, or the fact that the model is right ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time? And if it's right 99.999% of the time, we probably don't care too much about how it's actually working. Um, or, you know, it, it, so you kind of have to factor in what are the costs, you know, what's, what's you know, for that 0 0.0001, maybe that's a really super, uh, you know, a, a patient unfortunately dies or something like that. That's, that's a really, really hard sort of trade-off to make. But, I, you know, I think that's, that's one consideration. The other thing is, I, you know, I would kind of push back on, uh, a little bit. I know I talked about using simpler models to explain more complex ones, but you know, there, there are a lot of cases where simple models, although they appear interpretable, can go wrong in, in interpret interpretation. For example, like if you just do a simple linear regression and then you try and use the, the, the weights to interpret that and you don't have... Um, you know, you, you only have like a diagonal covariance over your weights. So you've not, you've not uh, modeled the covariance matrix. If you have correlated features in there, you're gonna get incorrect interpretations out. And that is a, like a classical mistake that is made over and over again. So I think, you know, just saying, oh, we need to have simple models because they're interpretable doesn't necessarily answer the question. Um, and yeah, and I don't know, do I think it's fair to make it, legislative i think it, you know they're trying they, they're trying to do the right thing aren't they but uh, it's it's a really really tricky area thank you very much <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, I'm i'll close on that, on that. On, i know on that yeah, note i think, um, to an answer. I, think <laughs> I can say um i can say it's been an absolute pleasure to uh, to have you here today tom and um, i will i shall give you another round of applause on behalf of the entire room <laughs> okay thank you very thank much you. thanks thank you very me. much indeed um so uh the next meeting will be sometime in march um and thanks again to tom for agreeing to speak today uh, this recording will as mentioned be available on the jgi website after the fact uh have a very good afternoon to you all thanks again tom <laughs>